Welcome to the Forward Ever podcast, where we highlight African immigrant leaders in New York and make visible the interest of Africans in New York's immigrant community. My name is Yata Kyuzolu, and you're hearing the sounds of Yakuba Sisoko. In this episode hosted by Connie Kai, we hear from Mrs. Dinsiri Fikru, an employee of the New York State Housing Department, an ACT community guardian, and a fierce advocate for the Ethiopian immigrant community in New York. She walks us through her childhood in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, growing up in America and contributing to New York City. Hi everyone, welcome to the Forward Ever podcast. I'm your host, Connie Kai. I am a senior at Barnard College and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Today is Saturday, March 20th, and I have the honor of interviewing our special guest, Mrs. Dinsiri Fikru. What is your full name and the pronouns that you go by? Um, my name is Dinsiri Fikru, and I go by she and her. So I read that naming conventions in Ethiopia are quite interesting. What does your name mean and what's the history behind your name? My name is my paternal grandmother's name and it's from the ethnic group that's called Oromo and it has two meanings. One is somebody who's ladylike and the second one is somebody who brings balance to things. I like the second one more than the first. (laughs) When and where were you born? I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in 1971. That is the capital, isn't it? Yes, it is. What was your childhood and hometown like? My family came from a solid middle-class family. We lived in a relatively rare apartment building next to the Hilton Hotel in the capital of Ethiopia. So in the, in the middle of town, it was one of the biggest and most modern hotels. And so we got a chance to see what life was like for people who were well off. Our neighborhood was a mix of modern and with donkeys coming and going on the streets with cobblestone streets that connect to the back of our building where there are much more informal housing kind of structures. And I grew up with my friends who lived in the building. My best memories are after kind of watching the Olympics or the World Cup, recreating our own competitions kind of in the in the courtyard and in the in the apartment complex and being different countries and athletes who competed with each other and a lot of soccer growing up playing a lot of soccer and our soccer balls were made of socks filled with uh, <laughs> with whatever was around that could make a ball wow that sounds like a very fun childhood yes yes what languages do you speak I speak Amharic and English, and I speak some French as well. I know that Ethiopia is such a diverse, and it's so ethnically rich, and it's ginormous, one of the most ginormous countries in Africa. I would like to know more about the cultural particularities about your ethnic group. I think because I grew up in the capital, which is not the, the kind of geographic region where my ethnic group is most dominant, my particular ethnic group influence is not as strong. That comes from my parents and kind of in some of the foods that we eat and our language is different, but because we grew up in the capital, I never learned the, the language of my ethnic group. It's just where my parents were born. And when in the summers we would visit my grandmother going to Nakamte, uh, which is where both my parents were born and raised. And so when we went, we family had a home where there was some agriculture, some farming that was done in cornfields. And we ate boiled corn and what's called chachapsa, which is, if you think of uh, very, very thick chapatis that are kind of broken up and mixed with some spicy barbare. And barbare, it's kind of a curry mix that's very spicy and red. 
uh, very unique to Ethiopia. And kave, which is like uh, ghee, I guess, which is kind of seasoned butter. And you mix it all up together. And it's, I think the parts about my ethnic group that stand out to me is my grandmother making those kinds of foods for me and kind of feeding it to me. But Ethiopian culture in general, it's a mix of a lot of different ethnic groups. But I think the theme that cuts across to me and that I've appreciated as an adult more than when I was a child living there is the sense of caring beyond your own self and family to your community and even those you don't know. A sense of generosity and warmth and hum humility too that pervades day-to-day -day life in a way that I find different than growing up here. Can you now cook what your granny used to cook for you? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> Ethiopian food, I, I think that my daughter is a vegetarian. And so even though I cook it, it's not our day-to-day -day food. So I'm very lucky because she became vegetarian. And because there's so many vegetarian options in Ethiopian cuisine, She's drawn to it. I love that it's readily available and that my kids are really appreciating it. Did you want to travel as a child? Did you travel within Ethiopia, within Africa, outside of Africa? Yes. There, I didn't think of traveling outside of Ethiopia, uh, within Ethiopia. We were lucky enough to maybe once a year go to the, the place is called uh, Sodare. And we would, with another one or two families, go for a weekend or kind of a long trip. And um, it's a place where there are hot springs and um, kind of cottages for you to sleep in. And I remember just really loving that and being scared by alligators and hippos that were also right on the streams in the same complex and monkeys everywhere that stole your food and, and snakes that you were scared you would find and get bitten by. So in terms of travel, I, that's what I knew. I traveled when I was living there. So I was 12 when I left Ethiopia. So I didn't think of traveling much outside of Ethiopia while I was there. Um, but have do I like to travel now? Absolutely. It's a very important part of my life and a way that I find to explore and learn about other cultures. So you left quite young at 12? I did, yes. Has leaving Ethiopia changed your perception of it? I think that I had a view of Ethiopia as a child when I was there, and I only had that perspective. And my first trip back to Ethiopia after I left when I was 12 was the winter break of my senior year of college. And it was a perfect time to go because it was when I was forming my own identity as an adult. And so that first trip back was really significant in fully appreciating Ethiopia. So my perceptions of it when I left were those of a child who experienced it as a as someone who's not independent, right? I just went where my parents told me and I just knew what was around me. And it just everything was kind of childlike. But when I went back, I think I was, what, 20? I had formed more of an adult perspective. I think there were inequality was very clear to me that how comfortably people who have means lived in comparison to people who struggled. Uh, so that disparity was huge and that affected me. But the things that I noticed about how giving and generous and humble people are, that trip when I was 20, that's when I formed it very clearly. That's when my I properly shaped my thinking about Ethiopia up until I was 12. And when I was a teenager here, it was all through personal experience. So did your family migrate first to New York City or somewhere else? What brought us first to the U.S. is that my mother was escaping an abusive relationship with my father. And she came to find work. And she worked in the regional office of the United Nations in East Africa, which is, you know, based in Addis Ababa. So she came to New York and took a test to be a civil servant within the UN. And she did well and was able to find a job. 
And when she did, she sent for us and we joined her. So my mom came and then within a year of being here, she brought me and my two brothers. What do you remember about the migration process, airplane rides, how you got here, your first day here? When we left Ethiopia, my mother was already here. So a friend of hers brought us. So we were traveling on, I don't remember if it was British Airways or something like that. That's what brought us. But it was, we were with an adult we didn't know. And the most striking part of that trip was that we had an overnight in London and we stayed in a hotel and it was very confusing because in Ethiopia at the time, television had one channel and it had programming that started in the evening. So I remember being struck by how fancy the hotel was. I don't think it was all that fancy. It just was fancy to me. I remember thinking, what? There are different channels and they're on all the time. And then when we landed um, in New York, my mom greeted us. And I don't know how she knew we would appreciate this, but she didn't greet us with Ethiopian food. She had made some fried chicken for us, which was delicious. We had never had fried chicken before, didn't know what it was. Ethiopian cooking is so sauce-based. The idea of just frying chicken by itself was different. It felt like we were in a new place, starting a new life, that there was a lot to learn. And that played out over the coming years because English is not spoken widely in Ethiopia, meaning when you go to school, you learn English, but everything is in Amharic, was in Amharic at the time. So there just was a lot to adjust to. So in addition to the language, just the foods and the noise and New York City and just all of it was a huge adjustment. I would love to know more about your school experience. It takes a village. We came to this country first in New York City and spent some time with my mom in New York City. But my mom had a brother in Northern Virginia, right outside of uh, Washington, D.C., in Alexandria. So our very first school year was actually at his house in Alexandria, Virginia. And so my first year in the U.S., was there in a suburban setting and it was in seventh grade and we didn't speak English and so we were just kind of plopped into classes and we followed and we had an English as a second language class that helped us build up the language to keep up in the other classes and so my school experience that first year I think one of the things that stood out the most is I could not figure how lockers worked at all. I just was at the mercy of somebody helping me open it all the time. So, and people would explain to me, turn this way and that way and skip this one time. And I just didn't speak enough to understand what they were saying. So that, that was that. So it just was, that was an example of something completely foreign to adjust to. And culturally, I think there were some things that we were doing that just didn't fit and that people didn't understand. And thankfully, I think because I didn't speak the language, I didn't understand if people were making fun of me or not, but it just, it was a, it was a big adjustment. So that was school in seventh grade. I think I had a really good friend from Ecuador and another from Cambodia, and we did a great job of supporting each other, even with our limited language to get through that year. So that's that's seventh grade. And I think the people in my life who are closest to me tend to often be immigrants. And I think we lived in Queens when I went to high school and Iran, Israel, like you just name it. There are people from wherever in my class, in my school, in my, in, in just, in my day-to-day -day living and in my educational experience. And same with college, my first year and second year roommates, the, the ones that I was kind of assigned with, were, were not immigrants, but who I ended up living with by choice were people, you know, with somebody who was of Ghanaian descent and another from Sri Lanka. And so 
and I was part of the African Students Association in my undergrad experience and was connected to the immigrant community throughout my educational experience, whether I sought it out or it was just around me. So my, my school experience, I think academically, math was the equalizer for me. Whether I spoke the language or not, uh, I, I felt like math carried me <laughs> to make sure that I, I was able to carry over the things that I learned without challenge. But in terms of social learning, what stands out the most is my connection to others and how we felt united in our differentness from the mainstream in our experience. Now that I've heard that you were well immersed in diverse cultures and ethnicities and that you were immersed in immigrant communities, essentially, how does mm -hmm. that compare with your daughter and her relationship with immigrant communities? Mm. I think it's taking shape and it's forming. So I have two kids and they went to a private school for the first part of their life and both were not so fully immersed in the immigrant experience as much. Uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of diversity in the schools that they attended. But now in high school, my daughter in particular is much more connected to different groups of people. But in terms of their personal connection, I know they're navigating it and figuring it out. And I'm patiently waiting for their post-college experience. <laughs> where they would have independently explored it and have come out with their own kind of experiences and thoughts about it. How do you practice Ethiopian culture at home such that they have a sustained connection to Ethiopia? Food is the biggest way. I think I, uh, I am separated from their dad, who is Kenyan. And so being Ethiopian is not the only culture that they experience. And so it's navigating it. So food is the way. Uh, I think we talk about different, you know, holidays and what they might mean. We, we don't do as much history and cultural practices and we're not religious. I think for a lot of families, their connection to the culture is centered around a religious institution, Christian or Muslim or whatever folks believe. So we don't have that as much, but in the travel experience, we have a tradition of traveling together. And we started with trips that built up so that they could find a way. So they've each been to Ethiopia twice now we last traveled to Kenya together so that they could experience that part. And their paternal grandmother is Jamaican. We went to Jamaica so that they could feel part of it. And so more than the Ethiopian culture, I think that when, I, when we've gone to Ethiopia, they've enjoyed it very much. One of the most special, special moments in our travel experience is that their last name is solidly Kenyan. Not just Kenyan, you know the ethnic group that their dad comes from just by saying it. And they didn't know that. And so we landed in Kenya and my kids look like me. They look very much Ethiopian. And they landed and showed their passport. And every Kenyan person who saw it said, oh, welcome home. And just welcomed them and made them feel super special about being there and welcomed. And so my kids have a tendency to say, oh, we're American, you know, that's your culture. And, and they're, again, like I said, they're slowly coming into it on their own. And that was a very special moment where summer of 2019, we went to Kenya together and I was the stranger who was visiting, but they were the two who were coming home because of their last name. And so that was a, a very special thing. And so it's to say that I just try to keep exposing them so that they feel connected. And I think how solidly they feel connected will come in time. You moved to the U.S. when you were 12 years old. Now, what do you think of when you imagine the word home? It's the place that I live right now. And it's very, because I came when I was 12, I'm in that weird place where home is Ethiopia and home is here. And I have enough of what being Ethiopian means 
in me that it colors my identity and it's part of me permanently. There's no shifting away from it. But I'm also shaped by having been here most of my life here being New York City. And so home is my home where I live where my family is. It's the community and network that I've built up here. But that community is, and network is made up of people who keep me connected to Ethiopia and to people not just in Ethiopia, but people who have who are from Ethiopia and have set roots here in New York. And so it's a very unique place that's my own. It's 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 not a whole country or a whole city. It's the, the mix of all of those things. When did you join ACT? I joined ACT, I believe it was four years ago. As my kids were getting older and as I had more time, I got much more engaged with the Ethiopian community in New York City and slowly became a member of the board of the Ethiopian Community Mutual Assistance Association. And as a board member of ECMA, that's a short name for it, I was invited to a training at ACT to be a community guardian. And I thought that's a fantastic idea to create a network of people who could be present for their own communities in a way that's just very well informed and filled with resource so that when we show up for somebody and they come to ask for help, we're not just deflecting and saying, go here, but we at least have some basic information to be responsive to their needs. I thought, what a fantastic idea to have folks trained, empowered to be present for people in that way. So I was very happy to go to that training and learn a little bit about how to listen, how to be there, A, and then B, what information to provide and C, where to send people for things, for the things that I don't know how to help with. So that's, that's what appealed to me about what ACT does, A, you know, first of all, and then what I learned as something that's real from having attended the trainings and seeing the work that they do. I would love to know more about ECMA and what is your proudest work that you have done with ECMA? (laughs) The Ethiopian Community Mutual Assistance Association was formed in 1981. And at the time it was formed by refugees who came from Ethiopia and settled in the New York tri-state area. That group of people worked hard to figure out a way to be a resource to people who arrived as refugees. There are many different ways people come to this area. In the 1980s, people who came from Ethiopia were refugees for the most part. And so there was a need to be established as a social service provider. And founders of ECMA and the people who established it would literally meet people at the airport with a warm jacket and take care of them until they got settled. There was a community center, there were or at at least an office. And the point was to help people get settled so that they could have a solid base to, to build on. And then to build up over time, a space for nurturing people's cultural connection and history and celebrating it and having a place where you could feel like you could celebrate that for yourself. And it's given how old it is, it's not as firmly established now. There was a a short period where, for different reasons, the organization lost its status. But about five, six years ago, another group of people revitalized it and reinstated it with the same idea about how to be present, but to be responsive to to all the different ways people come. It's less under just refugee status. People come as refugees or have come as refugees, but they come from the lottery, the green card lottery as well. They come as students and maybe stay. They are second, third generation Ethiopians who've been here a long time. So people from Ethiopia are here for lots of different reasons. And it's to re 
imagine the organization and reestablish it as some as one that is responsive to the needs of the community here. And so the point of ECMA now is how to make sure that the people who are who have resources are connected to the people who need resources. It's, so in that way, it's to provide you know, social service, to provide networking opportunity, to celebrate the culture of Ethiopia, and to, you know, to create kind of a, a mentorship and connection in the community. That's what ECMA does. The proudest is the pulling people together who really want to do something, but don't know what it is that they can do and making it concrete and defining it so that everyone feels like they can do something. And so one of an example of that, I, I talk about it as something that makes me super proud, is because it's the most concrete thing that we can develop. We, we had an annual meeting where we were looking for board members and we recruited whoever was in the audience to be on the board. And one of the people said to us, you're crazy, you don't know me. Like, what, what, what are you thinking? And said, thank you for the invitation, but I cannot. <laughs> but I'd be happy to help on the side on projects that you might need. And so what he did was study organizational behavior. And so what his contribution to ECMA was developing a strategic plan for us. And so over the course of two, three months, he worked with the board to say, what are we looking for? What do we want to do? And out of that came the roadmap for what it is that we want to do for the next five years or so. And so the proud thing is not the strategic plan. It's more that enabling people to give what it is that they can to make the community stronger. How do you see ECMA growing in the next three, five, ten years? We are a full volunteer-based organization right now, and we do not have firm address. We don't have an office. We don't have a community center. So good thing we have a strategic plan because I can tell you, <laughs> we would love to hire a part-time executive director over the coming year or two. In three, four years, we'd love to have an office where people feel like they could go to get the help that they need. Right now, what we focus on is connecting people to existing resources and using a volunteer base, but moving in the direction of having a go-to person to meet people's needs, I think would be fantastic. I think we're doing great in terms of celebrating our culture and having events that bring people together. We have an annual picnic. We're doing more and more activities that are responsive to the community. So if we continue that and keep widening our reach in that way and then work toward having a space and staff to be even more responsive and have wider reach, um, I think would be great. How has that changed during COVID? So this past year, we've had to just adjust and see what it is that we could do and what being responsive to the community means. So a year ago, we had, you know, every year we develop our calendar of events and we have to scrap most of what we had planned for 2020 and shift some of it to a virtual event. And so in terms of our events, we had to put things to the side, but we focused more on weekly communication to say, here's what's new, here's what you should know talking to people more about the stimulus and unemployment benefits and creating office hours staffed by volunteers who could help people fill out forms if that's what they needed. So those are the kinds of things that we did to be responsive. And so events got put to the side as we were trying to figure out how to be responsive to the immediate needs of people in the community. What changes would you like to see in the future for your community? for the Ethiopian community at large in New York? In New York City, there isn't a central like Ethiopia town or a neighborhood where most Ethiopians live. There are many, many of us 
and we are spread out among not just the five boroughs, but in New Jersey and in Connecticut as well. And each of us know our own respective networks and or know the people we go to church with or know our family and friends or know the people we've come across by accident. But the interconnectedness among all of those different groups is challenging in New York City. Just everybody's busy living their lives and it's very hard to, to bridge kind of what feels like silos among the, the community. And so if there is a way to have a central place, and this is where the office and a dedicated staff member come in, some way to unite us in and connect us all together towards being there for each other, that's something that we do. We'd love Building that out has been focused around what do people need and how do we respond? So every year, for example, we have, we've had for the last three years, a group of parents who've just gone through the college application process and just sent their kids off to college. And so those groups of parents have had college planning workshops for students who are about to do just that. Um, and so it doesn't matter what your religious affiliation is, it doesn't matter where you live, but if you are somebody who is got a child in high school, we do an overview of what happens in ninth grade, what about 10th, what about 11th, and then about the application process, and see if there are topical discussions like that that bring people together and keep doing those kinds of things and build connections among the people who show up so that we are responsive to people's needs at the same time that we're building up the community. How has the landscape uh, or your perception of New York changed at every stage of your life? I love, love, love New York. I've thought about New York as a super diverse place where folks can be whatever they want to be. As I get older and older, I've become much more aware about how you can have lots of people from lots of backgrounds in one place, but have those groups of people live independent lives that are separate from each other. So it's as an adult, I'm realizing more how even in this incredibly diverse city, people live in a way that's segregated from each other. I think we ride the subway together and mix in a subway station and on the train, but we're all going to different places. So, you know, based on your ethnic, ethnicity, based on your class, where you get off on the train is different. And so, you know, I love New York City and the kind of opportunity it provides. But as I grow older, I've become more mindful that where you live matters a lot. And there are many, many, many things that, are, that impact where you can live in New York City. If you could educate American universities, high schools, America at large about Ethiopia and the immigrant experience, what would you say? This really truly is a place of opportunity. New York City in particular, but America in general. And I think that it's really important to not try to fit people in boxes and to any degree that we can to be responsive to who's in front of us when we're working and planning for things. And so educational institutions, universities, be responsive to your students try not to categorize people in terms of what they should be and how they should behave and how to to oversimplify the complexities of the experience of, of people in general and immigrants in particular because we definitely have some themes that we share but have diversity within that within the immigrant community but even within one particular country uh, it, you know, from immigrants within one particular country. So universities are served well by trying very hard not to categorize immigrants as a monolith, but to really be responsive 
to students and to hear and respond versus assume and plan and not adjust. What is your take on the Ethiopian identity and the African identity? Because often in America, we subscribe to the, to the idea of reading people as, oh, this person is just from Africa, Pan-Africa. What is your take and perspective of that? I think the education system is very Euro-American centric. Um, and so from the get-go, it's very, very, very hard to conceive of the world as something, where, you know, as a place where, um, of course, American history and European history are critical to where we are but it's really important to have a focus on what others have contributed as well. And I think the curriculum had that to some degree, but I don't know the approach and, and how it's communicated matters. So all to say that I think it's a setup from the beginning that there's this group and then there's the rest of the world. And it's not just Africa, I think it's really the Middle East and Asia and like the rest of the world as well. So I think that there is a, a way of making things easy and categorizing groups. I think that diversity in schools, in work, in life is often talked about as something that's beneficial to people of color, but it's really about enriching the experience of everyone because often the things you learn and stick with you come from people you know and live and talk with. And, and so that value just has to be everywhere because it's only through that that you learn a lot of things about, oh, in Ghana, they speak this language and Senegal, they speak this other language and in Ethiopia, it's something completely different. So those things come from being exposed to people. And so my perspective is, yes, there's a lot of, oh, African must mean X, Y, and Z with very little understanding of the diversity within it. God help us, the diversity within even a particular country. Ethiopia has 80 different ethnic groups and languages. And so even saying Ethiopians must be this and that is actually an overgeneralization. So I think even starting by saying, I don't know, tell me, <laughs> or, you know, before assuming, just taking a step to learn a little bit more, I, I think is helpful. It's just the system, the way things are organized. Is there any upcoming exciting event in your personal life? How do you stay sane during COVID? I am active. I play soccer. And that keeps me sane. COVID and all other things for getting through all the busyness and the crises and challenges that come up. In terms of a personal event, my daughter's graduating high school. She's my youngest. So I will, as of next year, will have two children in college. So that's a big milestone I'm excited about. And if I could take a moment with ECMA, we have a board that is filled with young people. And I'm very excited about the ways in which they are bringing the younger generation into this work. On March 27th, just coming up in a week or two, we're having what's called the teen experience, which is creating a space for 13 to 20 year olds to talk to each other. Parents are not allowed. The leaders and facilitators of the conversation are the younger members of ECMA who are teenagers, not members, but board members of ECMA who are teenagers themselves less than five years ago creating that space. So those are the exciting things. That leads me to my next question. How do you think of yourself? Like, do you think of yourself as a hyphenated person, for example, an Ethiopian American or an Americanized Ethiopian person? Like, how do you perceive of the hyphenated identity? My son makes film. He, he wants to study filmmaking and he had to do a documentary and I had to help him. He said, so who are you? And, 
there's no getting away from being hyphenated. I think the way that I answered it is I'm many, many, many things. So yes, I'm, I'm a person who was born in Ethiopia. And for a long time, I wasn't an American citizen. So I called myself an Ethiopian who had not lived in Ethiopia for 20 something years and whose identity was formed by being here. So those are all components of who I am. So I was being a mother. So I was being a you know, a member of ECMA. So I was being an, an employee of the city of New York. So all of those things make up who I am. So I am an American, absolutely, but that's a very incomplete statement. There's many, many other parts of who I am. And so it's inevitable. Just even one hyphenated anything doesn't cover who I am is my thinking, but I, I, I don't feel particularly less American in the way that I see myself. How others see me might be different, but I also know that a rich description of me incorporates other parts of me. What is your day-to-day -day job since ECMA is a volunteer position? I work for the city of New York for the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. I'm the, the executive director for policy and special programs for the Division of Tenant Resources. So our division administers Section 8 housing subsidy for low-income households in New York City. What is the key takeaway that listeners should be mindful of and aware of about immigrant contributions to New York City? Immigrants, Africans make this country, this city stronger. And it's very easy to take that for granted. I think many immigrants figure out how to do their day-to-day -day survival and get through what they need to get through and give what they can, but often do it at a cost to them. I think it's phenomenal that organizations like ACT exist to support that community so that they can give more to New York in this country. We're very happy to be part of ACT. I am, as an individual, that ECMA as well and sees ACT as, you know, ECMA as a board, as an organization, sees ACT as a model for how to give back and keep supporting this immigrant community that gives so much to the city. You are currently the, the acting president of ECMA, right? I'm okay. the president of the board of uh, directors of ECMA. I want to know, what is your favorite nook in New York? Oh my gosh. I love going to La Libala restaurant which is on 113 and Frederick Douglass in Harlem. I'm a wonder. I love exploring. So my favorite thing to do is go discover a new place. But the place that's been my favorite for a long time is uh, Wagner Park, which is south-south Manhattan, where there's an open space and water and the Statue of Liberty and lots of green space and flowers. I like escaping to a place like that and just having a day to read, relax. I've never been, and I will be joining you. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. From this conversation, I feel that you are such a kind soul. Oh. And I'm so grateful that you're, you took the time to speak to me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so excited. Thanks for listening to the Ford Ever Podcast a collaboration between African Communities Together and Barnard College. To learn more about African Communities Together and the many ways you can support our mission, visit our website at africans.us or follow us on social media. Our social media handle on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter is AfricansUS. Like, comment, and share. Forward ever, backwards never. Who are we? Who are we? Over that